Yeah, great. Thank you, Gabriella. And actually, it's um, it's a really nice uh, through line from the previous talk, uh, looking at uh, and kind of charting the work of uh, Andrea Lissoni. You saw a lot of great images uh, that were very much about environments. Right now at Hasta Kunst, uh, Andrea has to show uh, inside other spaces, environments by women that starts in the 50s with work from Gutai. Thinking about immersion, it's a, it's a huge area with a long history and a lot of ways of, of thinking through where this has come through maybe centuries of like domes and fresco work to what we mostly understand in the post-war period with installation art, expanded cinema, a lot of these practices coming into uh, art history through also uh, then from expanded film to expanded video. Our talk is, well, Lawrence is here <laughs> and has an incredible video uh, on view, Black Cloud on the first floor. Uh, I hope everyone has had a chance to see it or will have a chance to see it. Um, and a really amazing opportunity to talk about Lawrence's practice and, and ground this talk in immersion, really in thinking about uh, virtual uh, environments as kind of maybe one layer of what we're talking about, both building and uh, building the environments and virtual cinematography uh, will kind of, I guess, chart a course through through your work, uh, specifically through um, practice of virtual cinematography. Um, and then I guess a next layer of immersion of also being presenting uh, digital works uh, in space and Lawrence's um, I think quite unique and incredibly brilliant practice of um, site-specific spe site work and approaches to layering virtual, also sonic uh, environments with the physical environments uh, through uh, architectural simulation, but that being actually only one uh, aspect of your engagement with simulation, uh, I find really fascinating through our work together in the last year. I've been learning a lot about the massively increasing role of simulation across so many sectors and industries from a lot of, I mean, smart systems is something Lawrence looks at uh, in terms of, you know, making a digital twin of a building, modeling, understanding, and also, uh, I'd say specifically work in game engines, which is also now very much taken up across uh, sectors and, and unex I'd say specifically work in game engines, which is also now very only going to expand and diversify um, uses in this space. And I, my practice as a curator, I think uh, most curators is always learning from artists, but over the last year, it's been absolutely exceptional and wonderful learning so much from you. And as we get into like more and more like newer technology, it's it's not like where I work in film and video and I have, you know, some ex understanding expertise of this coming working with an artist. Now I find myself more and more working with artists that are really pushing how these technologies are used and I'm learning about them through how artists are pushing that. So first, thank you for Thanks, <laughs> for, for a wonderful <clears throat> year of conversations and it's really lovely to have this space to, to share some of that. So I want to start uh, very broadly um, by asking uh, quite generally about your practice. You describe your practice as a 3D collage of uh, objects, of found objects and situations that are observed from reality. Can you tell us, <laughs> can you tell us what that means? Sure, so I mean, I come from a, a background in, in kind of like site-specific installation and architecture and electronic music. So, I mean, for, for me, I've always been interested in the process of, of composition. So, you know, what I, what I love about music is that there's essentially like two temporalities that it exists in. <clears throat> One is the space of performance, which is live in real time, and the other is compositional, where you're always working, let's say, on a score or in a composition for something to be performed in the uh, in the future, where like the kind of synthesis, the kind of gestalt of everything, only happens at a future moment in time. And similarly for architecture, I was you know interested in the I guess art form not as a art of building, but of the art of making different spaces basically which obviously has a lot of correlation with um you know set design and, and filmmaking as well this simulation of the rail to be captured from specific angles basically and um you know one thing that we'll be talking about more is also this idea of simulation not just like literal digital simulation but how you know um, buildings before they're made are made as simulations of either their kind of their visual references so like their 3d rendering before they exist or um, as you know, physical simulations in terms of like structures and engineering. So in terms of a 
fictional point of view, I was always thinking of architecture very much as a, the art of like fiction making as well, where even in a kind of commercial sense, you promise the existence of a future space to raise funds for the creation of that space. So it is a form of um, you know, spe speculative finance and, and storytelling in its own right, except it's so, it's so normalized into like the everyday environment that you kind of lose, lose sight of that. So um, in, my, in, my, in my work in general, I'm interested in, in very kind of popular tropes, basically, because my, my entry into art making was really through, you know, films, video games and music and, and books. So I've always thought about, yes, it's very kind of you to say, you know, artists like kind of pushing the envelope in terms of what is made formally, but also at the same time, because it's such a technologically dependent medium, we're also chasing what has been realized on a mass medium kind of scale. And that's definitely the case with um, uh, films and video games. About like five years ago, I had this idea that instead of chasing projects kind of commission to commission, it would make sense if I kind of had an overarching uh, kind of structure, basically, you know, what's called in more commercial terms, cinematic universe, to make different works intersect with each other in a, in a deliberate way. Um, one of these, one of these kind of tropes, really, of course, from a you know more mainstream point of view, the universe is made so that you uh, create this uh, stable of characters who audiences engage with, and um, kind of persist over time. Um, my interest in this cinematic universe was more the idea that in in production today, in cultural production, because of the um, atomization of content, creators of all art forms are being asked to create shorter and shorter content artworks more and more often of course as an extreme you see this with TikTok or YouTube but I also thought it, it's the same with my writers who get commit uh, my writer friends who get commissioned for you know 500 word articles by Monday instead of like a novel or a short story so I, I thought I wanted this overarching structure to link different works together and Black Cloud is the kind of culmination of of one of a uh, culmination of a certain mode of practice and also the start um, of another one um I made this very um, nerdy timeline to basically talk about this idea of world building as well. Like, of course, because world building is another incredibly overused word, but I also think like, what does it mean? Because from a, a political sense, of course, world building from, you know, utopia to political regimes is an incredibly charged term. And I think recently it's really a term borrowed from the genre of science fiction in order to translate um, new media to be understandable in this kind of cinematic universe way, but also in a way that embodies what is uh, a worldview somehow. So um, from like about 2013 to 2016, I was working on bonus levels, which was this idea where I thought, how could virtual worlds be made site specific in a way like kind of colliding the really um, unique properties or kind of behavior or idea of land art based, um, in the sense that it is very much tied to a specific place in time. And on the other hand, this like infinitely replicable virtual space that can be traversed by, you know, potentially millions of people. So bonus levels was a way of, um, you know, bridging the gap between this like simulation space that I knew from, from architecture really, and also this site specific space, which was also, at least in my kind of early days, like the dream of land art, you know, what if, there was like an authentic place that could be created that didn't necessarily need to be physically inhabited. Um, so that was my uh, kind of thinking with bonus levels. I'll just play, um, you know, talk over this clip from one of the bonus levels, um, early versions, which is called um, Skyline. And in, in London, it doesn't happen anymore, I think, but there used to be, um, poems on the underground. So basically, like you would get these poems, you know, just like commuting to work or whatever, and you'd be like, oh, that's so beautiful. And then, you know, you're just like crushed in the middle of so many different people. So in a way, I thought like one of the interesting things, like as a outsider who was, you know, coming into the art world is there's this like fiction called the art world. And I don't really think it exists. It's just a kind of collective of random people who are with shared interest, basically. It's kind of like a fan club for the idea of art. So I thought of like inverting that slightly, that in this work, basically, I would take some something so mundane, a, you know, a train on the way to work, and kind of like elevate that a little bit. 
and um, as you know, we'll see later, this idea of like uh, uh, forms of transportation and f forms of experience are like really key to my experience of the world and what I'm trying to show. Um, but here, this was before I actually had written any script, and um, I was essentially creating this collage, as you know, uh, Carly said earlier. This tube train, these poems on the underground, and a kind of fragment of voiceover as well. And and what was interesting for me, so this was um, basically what's happening here is I made a, a video game, um, this virtual environment in which like all of these um, disused uh, train station, uh, sorry, these stations are linked by this train line. And as you go through the different stations of the train line, each different station has like five different artist run project spaces in London. So basically my idea for this project was like, I wouldn't create an artwork about my own artwork. I would create like a container this like form of memory that would capture all these different spaces because um, you know these spaces are very transient unlike kind of uh, larger institutions they're here one year and gone the next so um, I made this virtual world and thinking about the cinematography essentially like with the first person video game um, I found that this essentially like steady cam shot or this first person point of view is one of the most I guess like you know fundamental perspectives that create this entry point of immersion into this world. And so when I was building the world, like literally making the 3D model, I thought kind of like a, I guess, cinematographer and a set designer at the same time, like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we start on the train, the train moves, there's this, there's this hole, so we t clearly see that it's this fictional train, we can look through the ground, and then we go up into the driver's carriage because, you know, it's this automated train. Um, so with this, I guess, with Skyline, because actually the the voiceover as well, it's taken from Wong Kar Wai's 2046, which is another kind of parallel form of world building. What I always thought of as an interesting, non-deliberate kind of world building is that in, in the director's earlier films, you would sometimes get um, a fragment of the future film, of, of the next film that's coming in the previous film. Um, when I read interviews, it became clear that this wasn't necess This was often for like a sequel that never arrived. But I just thought how interesting that was. That like somehow you have these anonymous characters, and you get this sense that you know they have their own life beyond how they are being seen on on the screen, really. Um, and so, with this bonus level series, the idea was that you know these different chapters would accumulate over time into this like virtual island that captured all these stories. Um, but yeah, so that's the. Uh, skyline. I was going to say, it's such a precise balance that you create between what you have um, modeled or simulated of uh, reference points you could map onto your experience of being in a tube or being at a tube station or being on this line um, or these spaces or the exhibitions that, that you see um, and the stops and where it takes you somewhere completely different that you've built out as this kind of more watery <laughs> uh, London world where the gherkin is somehow, yeah, in the middle of the water. And so from where you feel kind of anchors and where you really depart, and that's not only um, 
physical response to physical space that's uh, also in the perspectives. Um, so can you talk a bit about the camera? You, you said that you're modeling uh, in some senses very much off of steady cam, off of something we're accustomed to and you feel, it doesn't feel um, disorienting when you're watching this work. You feel kind of carried along because there are forms of uh, your, your camera work, your vit virtual cinematography that uh, we're accustomed to. And then some that could take us really, you know, to a perspective we, we probably won't get. Sure. I mean, I was thinking about like this idea, obviously, with, you know, cinema, the idea of like basically camera work and camera tricks basically are so fundamental to the, the medium of, of filmmaking. But I thought that in a, in a sense, like with a video game and, and this kind of shot has it that I'll shortly play, like you have multiple frames of relative motion, basically. So I was like, what is the equivalent of like a you know dolly track in in the game and here? Basically, the um, you know, I was like, what if the, yeah, we were riding on the train, and from the train we got this perspective of the city. So, in you know, in architecture, this question of like, what is the role of social architecture, or like the idea of utopia in the modern age when it's very difficult to achieve that? Um, I thought that in a kind of cinematic sense, the, a really um fundamental sense of the utopian idea is like vantage point and point of view so i thought what if in instead of taking this like you know how essentially how do you elevate literally elevate <clears throat> the the underground so that instead of being buried and having the world invisible for like one moment the entire world is ex exposed you know so it's like climbing up to the the peak and, and kind of looking down for this momentary sense of like agency and and, and freedom really so that's that's, I guess, the um, the freedom idea as embodied in the cinematography, and of course, in video games, having this like embodied point of view is also, um, you know, really fundamental to this idea of agency. That's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and then coming <clears throat> to uh, what you call the sign of futurist uh, trilogy with. Um, Films uh, Geomancer and Idol and uh, Game 2065. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, what the transition was? Also, in terms of building up a concept of uh, your concept of, of an approach to side of futurism, and how um, your approach within kind of game within creating virtual worlds uh, adapted for that trilogy. Sure. So, I mean. <clears throat> After doing about like, I think about eight or nine of these kind of bonus levels, site specific areas, I kind of started thinking like, I'd um, explored this idea of, yeah, what does site specific mean in the virtual age fairly thoroughly. And I started thinking like, okay, <clears throat> most of my commissions are really opportunities are coming from Europe, like Berlin, London and, and Scotland and so on. So I thought, why don't I kind of think back on a site from my childhood, I grew up in, in Hong Kong and Singapore, and actually embed this idea of futurity into them. Of course, it's kind of inescapable to have like the idea of a visual futurism, which is very much embodied within Singapore and Hong Kong as you know, cities and you know, kind of um, enclaves to some extent that had grown up in this super 80s, 90s capitalist boom. In the um, in the wake of you know colonialism and so on, so I thought my next project really, um, which is what would become the video essay Sign of Futurism and Geomatsu, would be an inquiry into the the vision of the future and how that plays out with with memory. So I was writing a um, the script for what would be become Geomancer, which is a kind of science fiction short film. And almost by accident, when I was starting researching the link between um, AI and China and the Chinese diaspora, I quickly saw that these two things were um, uh, Sinofuturism as an idea, this kind of promise and threat of technology or the promise and threat of mainland China will really mirror images of each other. And in this, I, I got a lot of inspiration from uh, you know friends who are involved with uh, Afrofuturism and Gulf Futurism. And, really this video essay came out of the surprise I had that there wasn't actually very much critical discourse or at least playful critical discourse about this this very subject. So for example, when I just very simply searched for China and AI on YouTube and Baidu and Yuku, which are Chinese um, 
uh, internet video sites. Um, I was struck by these two, you know, almost diametrically op op opposed camps. Um, either China or Chinese industrialization will save the world, basically, or, or destroy it. You know, so either on the sense of like, well, here we have this emerging basically superpower that is an antidote or an alternative to a kind of hypercapitalist modernity. And on the other hand, it's intensely problematic because, you know, you dehumanize labor and, and all of these kind of things. But I found that <clears throat> it was exactly the same discourse about AI. You know, they're going to steal our jobs. They work with a little pay. They're really good at computing, all these kind of cliches, but were really embedded in these in these ideas. So um, Sinofuturism was a, a video essay in, in seven chapters from computing, gaming, gambling, learning, and, and so on, that drew parallels between Chinese industrialization and AI very specifically. And um, so this really formed the kind of conceptual basis for this film Geomancer, which is set in the year 2065. Um, and 2065, it's the 100th anniversary, the centennial of uh, Singapore as an independent nation. So I was really thinking about what are the parallels between like an individual search for freedom, this, this AI, and the kind of nation states search for freedom and independence. And also the, the irony that um, as the nation state grows in strength, the agent <clears throat> the agency of the individual decreases. So of course, in in you know the the satellite, this AI in the sense is like the, an example of the citizen, but a technological citizen whose uh, being, whose birth, literally, and development is bound up in the uh, contradictions of 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 nation building for for Singapore. Um, but unlike, uh, Skyline here for the first time, I think I actually like wrote wrote a script that has you know characters that voice their thoughts as as monologues and and have relationships um, between different characters. Um, so I'll just um, play a short kind of a scene from from Geomancer just to give people a sense. I was really thinking about the format of a self-portrait or this kind of coming of age story. So essentially it's like, you know, portrait of the artist as, a, as an AI and they're going through their kind of um, self-questioning and self-awareness.我的样子我想要自拍但我没有脸我不得不截图留下集体的记忆我对存在荒谬和真理残酷和爱的意义做了搜索算法我吸收了一切一切被撰写下来的哲学家小说家记者诗人神秘主义者本是记俗者圣徒和罪人我每一样都阅读了一切都很清楚他们所有的逻辑所有的错误充满希望充满梦想是意识的主要特征吗？So <clears throat> here, in 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 a similar sense, I was really thinking of this, you know, um, Marina Bay as this synthetic landscape because it's built in Singapore on on reclaimed land. So somehow this, yeah, reconstruction or this construction from scratch of the literal architecture of Singapore um, is literally the background of this individual the, the geomancer, the satellite, their, their search for kind of agency and meaning within that. Um, but also embedded here is this idea that, you know, what would you think if you had absorbed everything, if you if one became fully educated to a like extreme degree, which is, you know, something that's also this idea of this like sublime intelligence in in Black Cloud and in Knox as well. Yeah. Um, it's uh, er, er, Artificial consciousness, if I've to be 
more precise with milk because it helps people, I guess, um, position that. But I, it's interesting thinking, so Gia Matzer comes down to earth, wants to be an artist. Um, I hope some people could, can come see the show in Berlin. Uh, we also have um, a trajectory of, of uh, uh, another form of automated mobility, <laughs> but uh, with a car that is um, also has uh, expressive uh, impulses. Um, and I liked our conversation. We were saying, you know, this car is an operational image artist, and we talk about Geometzer as uh, computer vision AI. Can you talk a bit about the types of um, computer vision, I could say specifically machinic perspectives that come into how you've created uh, these characters and then what comes into the film itself? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this this idea of, you know, Huron Faroki's idea of like the operational image is really this idea of my understanding, it's images created by machines for other machines without humans in the loop, basically. So there's this idea that, of course, you know, when you have uh, an image needs to be for, for humans to read a digital image, it has to be encoded and then decoded um, for it to be stored and then replayed. Obviously, it's different in analog media for analog filmmaking to some extent. But I was really thinking um, I'm working in a game engine, which in its sense is potentially an infinite film set. And but not only is it just potentially an infinite film set, but you can program the relationship between the camera, the subject and the background in in a way that it is both a simulation, but also in its kind of like in its own four walls of that particular scene, it is the complete reality of the situation. In in Geomancer, and I'll just kind of skip forward to a little bit here, this was made in, I think, 20, 2017. And back then I was, uh, it was also in the wake of um, DeepMind building an AI called AlphaGo, which be beat world champion Lisa Doll at the game of Go. And so I thought, what would a um, what might this neural network generated dream sequence look like? Of course, the reason I was thinking this is I have this satellite that I'm representing through video game rendering, but could I create essentially a neural network generated dream sequence that would encapsulate the film in itself? So kind of like this, I don't know machine learning mise en abime, what we have here about like towards the end of the film is a neural network generated dream sequence based on the first 40 minutes of the film. So it's essentially Geomancer dreaming its own recent memory. And some of the um, some of the objects or kind of symbol um, symbolism that is within this um, within this cut, which, you know, sometimes you can recognize spaces and buildings that you're moving within to. But near the end, kind of round about here, I was la, la, la. actually really shocked that it did what a human editor would call, you know, a match cut, cutting between a roulette wheel and an image of the earth. Um, and of course, it's just doing that because of their visual similarity. One second. So here's a, it goes to the casino, to this roulette wheel. When the soul of consciousness is born. And just goes between the roulette wheel and the planet. La, la, la. So if you were like, that actually surprised me so much, of course, because if you were like working with a human editor and they did a match cut between planet and roulette, we would be like, that's great. Well, you know, great idea. But of course, the, I, the strange thing to me was that even though I was researching so much, it, it did come across as truly unexpected. Um, you know, I won't divert too much into this idea of, you know, what is creativity or authorship, but just simply it made me realize that clearly, like, rather than thinking of this binary of like, you know, human labor, machine labor or creativity, what actually would happen in a collaborative medium like, like filmmaking or cinema was actually much more of a gray area than that. And just to say, it's recognized circular form in both, and it's that simple as in terms of its uh, recognition of basic features and patterns of the material. I exactly, exactly. Um, anything? And coming to the recent series, um, Black Cloud, you were saying, is, is both uh, culminating and also beginning. 
um, a new series of work. You might have noticed we've also had a bit of a journey through from the train to autonomous train to an autonomous satellite and now coming to the um, self-driving car within the smart city system that you see in Black Cloud. Um, can you tell us a bit about this this new chapter or trilogy? Yeah, sure. So um, after making Geomancer, and which was really much about the idea of dreaming and machine vision, the, the kind of final part in that first Sino Futurist trilogy was a feature film called Idol, which was looking more specifically at the voice and music. Um, but after that, kind of trilogy, which as you know, you, you saw is set in the kind of 40, 50 year future, um, which is a very kind of typical time frame for science fiction. You know, it's like within, you know, one or two generations time. I thought that with all the changes, obviously like post pandemic and with different geopolitical and cultural changes, rather than projecting something kind of 30 or 40 years in the future, it's actually something set in the near future or kind of like now. Um, so my kind of thought with, with this, sometimes I think from a site as a starting point, sometimes from a soundtrack or sometimes for the voice, I thought for Black Cloud, like what is this, um, how should I say, what is this other space that is being created almost as a byproduct of so many discussions about technology and, and geopolitics really. So I thought, what if, this emergent intelligence or point of view doesn't come from, you know, whatever, like the main global centers of the world, but it's actually from the outskirts of this like, you know, tier three Chinese, mainland Chinese city called Sim Beijing. Um, I was looking into a lot about the develop, the actual, not speculative development of AI, but actual development of AI. And I'm sure in every different country, they have their own automotive AI startup that are trying to do their own revolutionary thing. But I thought as, what if in China they essentially build the entirety of Beijing, called Sim Beijing, as a model to train self-driving cars? And part of the issue with training self-driving cars is, frankly, death is involved, you know? Um, death is directly involved, which creates lots of problems from a legal point of view and also regulation point of view. Um, there's a very famous, you know, idea of a trolley problem, which is, you know, a train is going down the tracks, you can only turn left or right, do you decide to kill, like, two uh, young children or five grandparents, you know, how do you build balances uh, to this impossible situation that, you know, one day maybe might be decided fully by an, an algorithm. So I was thinking about all these, you know, this legal issue, this um, subjective experiential issue, and this kind of spatial issue as well. But what I was thinking, going back to this idea of computer vision, is that the car is both, uh, in terms of like road movie or whatever, it's both like a cinematic trope and genre in itself. But the difference with the self-driving car is that, I guess, for the first time, not only might it be the, um, the subject, but it might also be the uh, protagonist of, of the story. So in this sense, I thought, what if um, we create this family of AIs and you kind of see hints of this in Geomat, so that have their own, I guess, psychology and psychological issues that basically they're working through. So not only are they like, you know, uh, created by this military industrial complex like in Geomancer, but here they're literally like the life of the self-driving car and their self-consciousness, they realize that their performance has come at the price of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of dead cars just like them. So if anybody has seen, you know, uh, crash test dummy footage in ultra slow motion, you know, you see this crash test dummy smashing through um, the glass windshield, the car crumpling, you know it's, inanim it's animated inanimate objects, but you can't help but feel this, or at least I can't help but feel this pathos of destruct, this theater of destruction for, for our benefit, you know, for humanity's benefit. So I thought that the moral problem for uh, this kind of transportation AI is this double bind. It's like, I want to perform, and I can't forget at the same time. So with Black Cloud, which is, if you've seen it, it's about a dialogue between 
uh, surveillance, city surveillance AI, and their built-in self-help therapist. So in, in this sense, I was thinking about, you know, apps like Headspace or like meditation, wellness that you get pushed when you're scrolling through Instagram or whatever. But I thought as a thought experiment, of course, a company would build this into their AI, like obviously, you know, because just like, was it corporate social responsibility or like employee free gym membership? Um, an AI company might do the same for their employees of which the self-driving car is one. So again, this paradox of like healing and meditation and genuine compassion, but you know, so you, so you drive better, you know, and faster. Um, I, uh, I want to come to the cinematography, but on this, I really want to talk about bodies and minds. Um, because we've had nice uh, conversations about the car as a body. We already call we already call cars like we think of auto body shops and auto body technicians, um, and it's interesting to think about you know how they're really now uh, with with the cars in your or, or enigma in in the work we're presenting in Berlin that cars I mean already have so many cameras to help you park might have an increasing amount of different sensors that are become stand-ins for like our senses, become further sense of like what this body is, but also this mind, there's this beautiful, or actually, or maybe we'll see a clip, this beautiful kind of blue glowing mind we see of um, a black cloud, but you also get the sense that it's it's not centralized, even though we see, yes, thank you, <laughs> this um, super beautiful, uh, maybe, mind. Uh, can you talk a bit about how, how you think about bodies and minds for these entities? Yeah, sure, thanks. I mean, maybe the first image that I was thinking of is um, uh, there's a beautiful end scene in, was it, Werner Herzog's Kaspar Hauser, which has a different title in German, and at the end, the, what's it called, like phrenologists, you know, people who study shape of heads and brains and stuff, very problematic, um, is cutting through Kaspar Hauser, who is this um, kind of feral child, like this mysterious child. Um, they're cutting through his brain, basically, and trying to see like, oh, you know, where can we, where, where was the problem? As if the pink gray mass could reveal some answers. In, um, in philosophically speaking, in like, was it Cartesian duality, dualism, there's this idea that, you know, the mind and body are split and the mind is essentially this like, uh, this vessel for pure, pure thought and the body is just the kind of wet, the hardware that moves it around. Um, in studies of like, cog like different AI research phrase, um, fields like cognitive robotics or neuroscience, there's a parallel argument that says, no, actually, intelligence is not something purely that exists in this disembodied mind. It's something that is embodied. Like intelligence is very much tied to a being's physicality or a being's like sensory immersion in, in the world. So obviously, you know, human beings with the kind of five plus whatever senses um, creates this sensorium of our perception and therefore our world. Um, I thought, this is all very interesting, but how, how am I going to represent this idea of that impossibility of visualizing consciousness, this Caspar Hauser cut through the brain problem, and also the how do we show that, this impossibility, and create this space where we can uh, simply imagine that it exists. So um, in, this, uh, in, the, in this clip here, which is from, I guess, the end scene, not that there's many scenes, the end scene from Black Cloud is the therapist Guan Yin talking to the city AI about the city AI trying to embed themselves into these different bodies. Because the problem, I guess one of the problems for the city AI is that they're filled with the promise of so much experience, but at the same time, what they lack is the boundaries of, of having a body. So in this, the um, city AI is being embodied in this uh, in this fox, which they have seen throughout the city otherwise. But this fox, not just as a symbol of nature, but as this symbol of like an em embodiment far more limited, but far more, how should I say, far more vulnerable um, in, in terms of how it's uh, moving around the scene. And then we can talk about the cinematography of this. Yeah. 相同的场景，但在不同的夜晚，这一次
，你将把你的思想一分为三，想象你是停着的汽车，是一位拥有人体的心理学家，也是默默的关注着汽车和人类的狐狸。把记忆力集中在狐狸上，感受拥有它的身体和灵魂，拥有自由的本质是什么感觉？如果你不说话，也没关系，静下来。放松，成为所罗门的狐狸。So, so this idea of Solomon's fox comes from an earlier scene where I was looking at,、um, I mean, basically what's called Solomon's paradox, which is、uh, people are much better at diagnosing other people's problems than their own, basically. So. In this, it's like you give your friend much better advice than you could give yourself. So I was thinking with this,、um, with this AI, which is not just like a single consciousness, but also has the ability to imagine many different selves. That the idea that how should I say the the problem is an excess of identities, basically. So by、um, yeah placing themselves in this body, this basically non-verbal animal, this fox. Um, that might be a way to like transcend the problem of、uh, of doubt, basically.、Yeah. I really appreciate that in your、uh, approach, you get everything from how systems are functioning. You get really how you're thinking on the you know infrastructural level,、um, how the you know the thematics that you're looking at to even different philosophies of the mind or or even Buddhism that come through how. Everything is structured, but I want—I want to cut also in the interest of time. Really want to come to、um, in what we just saw.、Um, I understand, learn like you to create it. It's still if,、uh, sorry, borrowing language from cinema. Still composited in some way, and you are playing in, within the game. You are playing and, and moving the character of the fox. Can you talk a bit about sorry? And, and as a lead into the next talk, artist backstage and, and a bit about production. It's nice to hear and understand a bit of the, really the labor question and the, and the production of how when you talk about game engines as kind of almost all encompassing cinematic.、Um, Production in terms of sets and the characters and movement and camera angles.、Uh, can you talk a bit about how how this was created? Yeah, sure. So I mean,、um, you know, it, with Skyline at the beginning, I was showing how essentially I'm moving through as a first person point of view. Whereas here, I am. I built the set and then I was、um, controlling the fox. So I was playing. It's very meta here. I was playing as the fox. Moving through the scene, knowing that the next shot after that, then I would be controlling the cinematographer,、uh, chasing the fox which I had just captured, basically. So it's kind of like when、um, I don't know, you know, when when actors play their own twin or something like this, and they're in different frames in the film. Here, I was thinking, how am I going to move as the fox? Go through the scene doing fox-like things, like maybe sitting down and kind of turning my head in a mysterious way, and、um, that was, you know, I'm like, I'm going to look right. <laughs> That's enough. Then maybe I'll look back left, and then the next, the next take,、um, as the cinematographer, then I was like, I'm going to go over the shoulder of the fox that I just was on the right, and then look over on the left, and. Have this like fluidity of of movement in in cinema cinematography. It's called like having um was it motivated camera movements basically where、um, something in the world moves and then our curiosity goes into that place, which is actually a level of sophistication that you know for me being a kind of self taught. I mean I didn't I didn't realize it was a thing, but then afterwards I think the the challenge of cinematography and and editing and so many things in 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 art making is like. It is hopefully invisible when it is achieved, you know. So this idea,、uh, going back to this idea of immersion, immersion is is I feel from a thought perspective, immersion is the opposite of cognition. I mean, it's not the opposite, but it 
it's a state created when one is no longer thinking. It's like, oh, I wonder how this was made. I wonder what I'm going to do next. It's just like you are, you know, in the flow. And sometimes, again, going back to this compositional thing, you know, I spent ages making this forest. So it felt good, in a sense, to not think about, is this tree right? How is this angle? Is that branch too dead or whatever? But how am I going to move through? So thinking about this set, not as a sculptor, but as, a, as an agent, as an as a, as animal, really, um, inhabiting this world. And um, the last thing is that, I'll say in, in kind of 3D games, you know, there's two main points of view very often. Um, first person, you don't see your body. And then third person where you see the body, or it's kind of like a over the shoulder shot. So really this whole scene, I was thinking, what might this, you know, virtuoso over the shoulder fox shot, might, what might that look like here? So, um, and, then, and then right at the end, um, oh yeah, the, the kind of fox runs off and the, the kind of camera stays. Um, and so, and to jump, sorry, also in the interest of time, I want to come to, I guess, the next layer of immersion we promised at the, at the top of the talk, um, which is how you bring your work into space. And um, in Berlin, uh, what we've um, produced, what you've produced, and, and I actually should say composed for a very tough and very big space, which is actually the image uh, you just saw this building, which is in Charlottenburg in West Berlin, um, that you have modeled and then placed on a kind of off-ramp of, of a highway. Um, the work you, uh, well, sorry, I, I actually can hand it over to you to describe the work and then how you encounter, um, you know, the building that you're in and navigate that, because I think that that layering, mapping of one onto the other is, um, yeah, to me, such uh, such an interesting way thinking about expanded cinema. This is there's a lot of ways to think about this work about expanded cinema, but even that act alone somehow is re-signifying all of the walls and physical space around you in a new way in terms of what you're seeing in the virtual world. But um, this will be my last question before we before we make space uh, for the audience to come in. Sure. I mean, I'll just talk about this quickly. So or try to. Um, so Knox follows on from this world building from Black Cloud where we're in this smart city and this building, which does physically exist in Berlin, has been taken onto this highway and turned into a, a rehab center, rehabilitation center for bad self-driving cars, basically. So um, continuing this idea of uh, like surveillance and control and, and resistance within that, I um, recreated the physical space both outside and inside the building. Um, I, I'll just show, uh, talk over this. So that the set design in the actual exhibition, which I'll show shortly, is the same self-driving car training slash test center in the, uh, in, the, in the films and in the audio track. So uh, cinema cinematically, I won't talk too much about that, but it's more the idea that further, even further than what we had seen in Black Cloud, here we're really with the car, but with the car as it is being surveilled, not in an outdoor urban setting, but in an interior one. So in the exhibition, there's various different stations, kind of like levels in a video game or like in immersive theater, really, but they're all kind of spread out through the space. And as you walk through the space, you get the voiceover, the soundtrack of this, uh, this kind of AI as it's moving through the space. Let's see if we have some audio here. Story. We don't have access to any faces or biometrics. Maybe I've seen you before in the back seat. Maybe you are my actual owner on the certificate. You never know. It's like if your Tesla talks back. I heard there was a case when a person got into an accident. Their family was so excited about the inheritance that they sponsored the crash vehicle itself. But that was before my generation. In front of me, I saw Vanguard getting scanned. The imaging unit went through the undercarriage, checking every component. On the Great Silk Road, this would be an unthinkable luxury. So in the in the different scenes, basically, it, it refers to the building in different ways. Here we're in the interior, and I'll just kind of skip right to the end, where we, um, after kind of driving through 
uh, driving through the smart city, this is kind of a flashback, um, we see the car drive in to Knox, which if you go to the exhibition, you know it's the same space that the, um, that the exhibition is in. So, you know, going back to this uh, site-specific idea, um, I'll just briefly show some of the shots from the uh, installation. Um, on the, the building is on three floors. On the ground floor, it's like this entrance of this car crash um, uh, welcoming, welcoming people into Knox. Um, the rehabilitation center operates on a program of like five days. For this, I was like looking at, you know, how do human rehab centers work? And it's like, I mean, the, the fancy ones at least. Um, you go in for a week or a weekend or a month long program. You kind of like, you sign up and you get uh, fixed within this particular time. So I thought the structure of the different islands or stations within Knox is like day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five. So on different days, you kind of progress, you progress through the treatment. And as you uh, walk through, you have this audio soundtrack that guides you through the space with the different voiceovers, one of which we just heard. Actually, that, that you generate through, you, through your movement. Also generated through your movement. <laughs> Um, so, in, in, in a video game, basically, the way that audio works is locative. So, you know, let's say you move into this part of the level or this part of a room, and a new soundtrack or voiceover or sound effects get triggered. Essentially, what's, what's happening here is like a physical version of, of that. So, as you move into this, you know, sit down in these car seats, um, day four gets played, and as you move through the space, uh, different uh, zones get triggered through that, throughout that. Um, because well, the technology, the locative sound technology itself is using not the same, but also using a game engine for that spatialization and model. Which is quite interesting. Sure. So, um, so here's I guess both uh, this real, like literal idea of a site-specific simulation in which the the structure, the fabric of the building itself is also the uh, the scene, the scenography within the video works, but also there's this um, audible level. I think the entire kind of Audible soundtrack is kind of like a, it's like an hour long, um, but it's deconstructed so that your movement, the visitor's movement, becomes the trigger for that interaction. So, you know, in a sense, it's playing with this idea that in a game, the agency you get and therefore the sense of immersion you get is is different because your actual behavior or your desire really um, feeds back onto what's what's happening. Um. Right. Okay. <laughs> Gabriel, we, would, we have about 10 minutes for questions that, that we will uh, open up for. I don't know there's the microphone. Is there a question here? There's one in the back. Thank you um, for a mind blowing uh, trip. Um, I find it fascinating, your humanization of AI. So in this midst of like head of open AI getting fired, discussing what is the role of AI, is it good, evil, et cetera, you've kind of parachuted us to 2046 and said, I'm, you know, I'm, we're going to go through it and we're going to see what it's going to be like as a lived experience. And your human, uh, humanizing of AI, uh, especially in the film, showing here at Loop is kind of fascinating where almost the fox is the stranger and you get sucked into the surveillance camera and the self-help and you think, okay, this is, this is how it's gonna be. So is there gonna be an AI of you as the artist uh, kind of creating what they thought humans were like looking back at us? I mean, are you, because I find I find your multidisciplinary background also fascinating. I'm an urban planner, so I've lived with um, simulations and perspectives and walkthroughs for a long time. Um, and so it's so refreshing to find somebody who has such a command of the medium and then takes it to another level. So I guess I have more than one question in this comment, but I'm sure AI can sort that out. <laughs> No, th I mean, th thanks so much. I, th I think first I'll talk about the, the, human, the humanization idea, basically. So in, um, <clears throat> in uh, how should I put this? I guess first off, like in, in anthropology, for example, if we look back at kind of like old school, very problematic 18th, 19th century anthropology, there's a big difference between uh, the, the, the 
uh, Homo sapiens, shall we say, as the object of study, and the human, humanitas, as the bearer of knowledge, basically. So this difference between humanitas and anthropos obviously per persists to this day. And just as not all humans have human rights and so on, it is, let's say, an unequal and imbalanced thing that, of course, when it's positioned as humanity versus technology or humanity versus AI, it's this idea that there is a unity be behind the human race within uh, something outside, the alien, the invader from another planet or another world, which has been obviously played out a million times, especially in science fiction. But um, my, my actual particular interest, I guess my political interest in the idea of the AI is not just what's happening on the ground with like corporate intrigue and stuff like that, but it's really like what is <clears throat> uh, the non-human or the AI as both an allegory for whatever excluded marginalized group there is, as well as this, this difference. So that's one thing that is a historical similarity that people of all kinds have not been people until they have been, very simply. And that process has been unequal and uneven and sometimes regressive. So in a sense, like by equating like this nameless faces, let's say Chinese workforce with the AI, I felt that in line with in a sense, Afrofuturism or this uh, or Gulf Futurism, it is a way to establish the agency of the non-human, whether Homo sapiens non-human or technological non-human, as a way to establish agency on its own terms without having to like resort to this idea of please see us who for who we are, but uh, you know, and and we can be naturalized like you, we can be anthropomorphized like you. Instead, it's like, we are this way, and we are self-conscious enough to be this way, and therefore, we should be seen. So that's the idea of the humanizing side. Um, as for this speculative side, um, the answer is yes. For, I mean, not that I want to make myself to an AI, but along the same time, uh, similar times, I was thinking about, like, oh, why is content being shorter and shorter, more and more atomized? I thought, what if, instead of me, Lawrence Leck, being an artist born in, you know, in Frankfurt or whatever. What if I am not just a, uh, a person with this biological backstory? What if I am realizing my future self? So in, in Geomancer, uh, which is set in 2065, there's a fictional company called Farsight who, you know, make AI and all this sorts of stuff. And I thought, what if actually, like, in terms of world building, I stop being an artist realizing my dreams and my ideas. And actually, I imagine myself as this future Farsight employee in their marketing team making artworks so that Farsight will exist in this, in this future scenario. It's very, it's very like weird time travel kind of thing. Um, some of my friends in, in London are involved in this kind of, I guess, philosophical fiction idea called hyperstition. So hyperstition is basically the idea, it's like superstition except it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's like, you know, don't trip over that step and then you end up tripping over that step. Somehow I thought like as a way to um, explore this idea of an AI being also not just a product, like a, an artwork that will never, uh, has no agency actually, it's something that is coming into, into being as not, not open AI or anything, but as, as me or any other individual is imagining it. So in Geomancer, Geomancer, the AI, has also seen my video essay from the last year because I thought, of course, every open AI, you know, any future AI that watches everything online is also going to see all of this stuff. And they'll be like, oh, how cute. Shows about AI. Um, but in a way to like wrap in this fiction and nonfiction aspect and maybe going back to the cinematography idea, one of the things I, I really envy really with documentary filmmaking or live action is that things behave and then you can capture them and sometimes beautiful things happen. Um, so in a way I'm trying to free myself from a kind of more formulaic idea of the filmmaking process where things happen in a, in a, in a linear frame. So sometimes that kind of long-term view helps, helps with that. Thanks for the questions.
Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> You mentioned uh, that you used the neural networks to create uh, the dream sequence. Neural network is something that was you know, talked a lot about in the 80s and the 90s, very much like AI is being talked about now, the possibility of you know, actually creating something like the human mind with neural networks. How do you define the difference between AI and neural networks, or how do you think about these two things? Sure, I mean, I won't... I'll, prob I'll, I'll reference what an AI researcher would say and I guess what I would say. So I think, like I was saying, uh, with the art world, let's say, it's the art world is like a random collection of people and things doing interesting things. AI is a field of research. It's not one singular thing. Um, it is a cultural product, it's a speculative product, it's a financial product, and a field of <clears throat> a field of computer science and engineering. Um, in terms of its present generation, yes, the idea of, I think, um, Minsk, many different, uh, and the idea of neural networks is one framework for trying to create an artificial intelligence in computing, in digital computing, by using interconnected series of neurons, which basically mimics the structure of the biological brain, but of such complexity that you know cool stuff happens basically. And so, even though it is a, um, an idea, neural networks has been ongoing for many different decades. People say that with deep learning, which is essentially multi multi layered neural networks, it's only with the advent of much more powerful computational devices that more interesting results have been able to be made. Interesting to the degree that, you know, even the engineers cannot really say why things behave as they do, which is a huge problem with um, regulation and, and development and so on. So I won't say what my take on it is. It's just that AI is a, a cultural field and a field of study and neural networks is one of the modes to achieving uh, innovation within that field of research, I suppose. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lance. Thanks so much. Generous as always.